Um, thank you everyone for coming along um, this afternoon to um, this webinar um, on forfeiture, um, which as you've already noticed, um, we have Jamal Dabachki and Peter Petz um, from Gatehouse Chambers, um, who are kindly um, presenting to you today. Um, Jamal and Peter are absolutely top notch um, and know so much about forfeiture, they've written, co-written a book on it, co-authored a book on it. Um, so do go out and get that. Um, unfortunately, this isn't in person, so you can't get them to sign your book if you have already got a copy. Um, just a, a few bits of housekeeping from me. Um, we are recording this webinar um, and I believe it will be put somewhere in the ether if anybody wants to catch up on it afterwards, if they missed anything or wanted to listen to it again. Um, if you do have any questions, um, there is, should be at the bottom of your screens, a Q&A function. Please do, do drop any questions in um, there and I'll keep an eye on them. We'll be dealing with any um, questions at the end. So please feel free to ask those away. I, from recollection, you can ask with unity because I don't believe that they are circulated to everybody. Um, and last but not least, um, Bristol Law Society has a um, seminar, in-person seminar next week um, in association with Landmark Information Group um, about climate change for the legal property sector. Um, Day the 11th at midday, um, which is, has lunch and refreshments provided. So please do sign up to that if, you, if it's something of interest to you. Um, but without much further ado, I will pass over to, um, as he himself uh, said earlier, and if you missed, um, pro Junior Property Barrister of the Year, um, according to the Legal 500 anyway, um, Jamal Damachki of Gatehouse Chambers. Superb. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. I'm not sure. Am I, am I spotlighted? Um... I think you will be when you start sharing your screen. Fine, there we go. Okay, well, let me do that without further ado then. So let's get this up and running. So there we go. So yes, um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and let me begin by thanking the Bristol Law Society for inviting us to talk about uh, this topic, which, as Ed has said, is uh, very close to our hearts, forfeiture of leases. Um, and as Ed explained, Peter and I have indeed recently released a book on forfeiture uh, called Forfeiture of Leases. Uh, published by none other than the Law Society. Uh, now, you may be pleased to hear that some reviewers have noted that this is the foremost book on forfeiture available today. Um, other reviewers have noted that it is, in fact, the only book on forfeiture available today. But, you know, I'm not letting that take away uh, anything from this. So, uh, in any event, let's begin. This is a webinar on forfeiture. Um, however, it's going to focus on some of the practical sides of forfeiture. Uh, we all know that failure to pay rent is the main reason a landlord may seek to forfeit a lease. But if you're anything uh, like me, you'll be sick of articles and lectures on moratoriums, COVID arbitration updates and the like. So we're going today to look uh, at uh, uh, non-rent breaches uh, and then pitfalls. Uh, and as this is a practical webinar, we'll look at some practical examples. Um, following my section, Peter is then going to be discussing in a little more detail one of the biggest pitfalls that most landlords will inevitably fall into at some point. So without further ado, let's start with the basics. Forfeiture. What, what, what do we mean by forfeiture? Now uh, I'm sure you all know this, uh, but forfeiture is really a right to determine a lease by the landlord if, when it's exercised, it operates to bring the lease to an end earlier than it would naturally terminate, and it's exercisable in the event of some default by the tenant. Now, uh, default is not always required. One can forfeit a lease, for example, if a tenant goes insolvent. But this is a pretty good working definition uh, of what forfeiture means. Now, it perhaps goes without saying, but you can't forfeit unless you have a right to forfeit or a right of re-entry. And the most commonly expressed right is this uh, express forfeiture clause or express right of re-entry. Um, usually it'll look something like we see on the screen now. Uh, now, 
let, 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 let's break this down a little bit because uh, a lease is, of course, a form of contract. Clauses in the lease are contractual terms. And as we all know, terms are either conditions, warranties or uh, innominate or, or intermediate terms. Uh, a condition gives rise to a right of an innocent party to treat the contract as repudiated, whereas a warranty will just sound in damages. So a forfeiture clause in a lease simply confirms which covenants are treated as conditions. Uh, failure to pay rent is the most obvious one, uh, but this form of wording you see on the screen at the moment effectively elevates all tenant covenants into conditions. Now, some leases don't have a forfeiture clause, uh, in those cases, it's, it's usually thought that you cannot forfeit, but that's not strictly true because as with any other condition of a contract, you can terminate if you treat the breach as repudiatory. Realistically, absent a forfeiture clause, the court will be slow to hold that a covenant uh, is a condition. Um, rent or failure to pay rent is the most likely one, but none rent breaches of covenant are more likely to be deemed intermediate terms or, or mere warranties. So this, at least my section of the talk, is talking about non-rent breaches. So we'll look at some of the most common non-rent breaches now. Uh, and these four are the ones that I've identified as the four which will crop up probably most frequently in practice. And we'll look at these in turn now, starting off with user restrictions. Uh, now, user is my favourite uh, 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 of, of clauses because uh, it's the one fre most frequently encountered of non-rent breaches. Um, it's common to include in leases all manner of covenants restricting the tenant's use of the premises. Uh, so I've got some examples up here. Again, some of the most common ones, prohibitions on causing a nuisance or annoyance, uh, prohibitions on running a trade or a business, uh, conducting a legal or immoral activity, or on use other than as a residence or a private dwelling. Let's break this down a little bit further. Let's look at nuisance and annoyance, first of all. So nuisance, well, nuisance entails, as I say here, the legal definition of a nuisance and uh, all the complications that that uh, may entail. Um, annoyance, however, is even wider. Uh, it's been said that annoyance is that which raises objections and unpleasant feelings in the minds of reasonable men. Presumably uh, reasonable women uh, uh, never raise objections and unpleasant feelings, I don't know. Um, and a thing which reasonably troubles the mind and pleasure, not of a fanciful person or of a skilled person who knows the truth, but of the ordinary sensible English inhabitant of a house. Um, so if we just remove the innate sexism and xenophobia of 19th century judges, this remains a pretty good working definition of what an annoyance is. Uh, what about, uh, or in fact, actually what I've said here, practical considerations, what, what, what do I mean by this? Well, compare a nuisance breach with a breach involving a nice simple question like a structural alteration or business use. For a structural alteration covenant, either the wall is there or it's not. Um, for a business use, either the tenant is running a business or it's not. But for nuisance, or even worse, annoyance, this is objective. If you line up 10 judges, uh, you're going to get 10 different answers over how annoying something actually is. But more so, how do you prove that something is an annoyance? You need witness statements, you need live evidence, there'll be cross-examination. And then what is a simple dispute results then in a multi-day claim where you're needing neighbours to attend court to inform uh, uh, the court or the tribunal that they can hear music through the walls. So I often say to, to solicitors in this situation, is there a clearer breach? Uh, what, what one example that's frequently thrown up in, 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 um, in my experience is uh, uh, Airbnb situations where I'm sometimes asked to draft applications for a determination of breach for uh, using a property for Airbnb. And the instructions also say, uh, let's also please throw in noise or throw in uh, noise nuisance or, or, or annoyance. Um, and my response to that is often, well, that's fine. We can do that if you want. But do you really need to? Airbnb is a nice, simple breach. Annoyance, nuisance. Suddenly, this is going to now be a lot more complicated affair. So just th something to bear in mind there. Where were we? Uh, user restrictions. Now, let's look at trade or business user, uh, because commercial leases, as we're aware, may well prescribe a certain trade or business. They'll often include a keep open clause. 
but residential leases will commonly prohibit business use. And for residential leases in particular, it's important to pay close attention to the exact wording in the covenant. A case in point is the case of Triple Rose and BT, a 2020 decision of the Upper Tribunal. In that case, there was a prohibition on the tenant carrying on any trade or business upon the property. So this second clause here. The tenant was running an Airbnb business, uh, but Martin Roger QC found that the tenant was not carrying on a business upon the property because the tenant was carrying on a business elsewhere and using the property. It would have been a breach if the, the lease had uh, included the first clause, um, but it didn't. So again, keep an eye on the precise wording in the clause. Uh, and then finally uh, on this slide, illegal or immoral use. Well, back in the day, by which I mean the in the eyes of the uh, 19th and early 20th century judges, immorality was a wide term. And at one point, living as an unmarried couple would have uh, been the height of immorality and would have led to your lease being forfeited. Nowadays, these clauses are rarely seen in practice. Now, if the property is being used for an obviously illegal activity, like a cannabis farm, then so be it. But in terms of immorality, just about the only thing still seen as immoral in the eyes of the property courts now is using a property for prostitution. Absent that, this clause will get you nowhere. Moving on then, still dealing with user restrictions, use other than a private dwelling house or residence. Now, uh, again, in, in my experience, the, these, these uh, clauses were pretty infrequent, uh, uh, infrequently encountered up until the past few years. Nowadays, what with the rise of Airbnb and the likes, the majority of user covenants I come across are these forms of short-term lettings or complaints about these short-term lettings. Invariably, if there is a covenant restricting use to a private dwelling house, a private residence uh, for residential purposes or any similar such wording, all of those clauses will be construed to prohibit short term lets um, and short term lets would include lodgers, paying guests or your standard Airbnb or other holiday lets. So moving on then from user restrictions, let's look at the next one, which is alienation. Now, in virtually all leases outside of long residential leases, there will be a prohibition on some form of alienation. Uh, these covenants may be absolute or qualified, either prohibited entirely or requiring a landlord's consent prior to the disposition. And now, these forms of covenant are usually worded to cover a multitude of sins, like we see here, assigning, subletting, parting with possession, etc. So let's again break this down a little further. Um, assignment. A couple of things to recall here, a couple of traps to be wary of. To breach an assignment clause, there must be a legal assignment of the term. So for registered land, until the assignment has been completed by registration at land registry, there has been no breach. Secondly, bear in mind that a, a, a subletting for the entire duration of the term amounts to an assignment. So even if subletting is allowed, this may still be a breach. So that was actually still dealing with assignment before we move on. A uh, couple of other matters. Bear in mind section 1901 of the uh, 1927 Landlord and Tenant Act. A uh, qualified covenant, so this is one where the landlord uh, has to give consent for any uh, alienation, it is read subject to a proviso the landlord uh, cannot unreasonably withhold or delay in providing consent. So if a landlord fails to deal with a request reasonably or swiftly, it cannot complain if the tenant then assigns without consent. And finally on alienation, uh, a relatively niche point here, who to serve? Well, usually this will be obvious because of course you serve the tenant. But what if there's been an unlawful assignment? Do you serve your section 146 notice on the assignor or the unlawful assignee? Uh, the answer is, an unlawful assignment still takes effect as an assignment, so you would have to serve on the assignee. Albeit remember that with registered land, the assignment has to be completed by registration to take effect. Now, in reality, of course, I would always recommend that you just serve 
everyone under the sun, serve the assignor and the assignee, then it avoids uh, any arguments down the line. Okay, still on alienation. What about subletting? Well, subletting is quite a fun one because here you really need to carefully read the clause itself. So, up on your screen now, covenant not to sublet the whole will not prevent a subletting of part. Okay, nice and simple there. What about a covenant not to sublet part only? Okay, well, that will not prevent a subletting of the whole. So that's fine. And then, of course, we have the covenant not to sublet any part. Now, that will prevent a subletting of part or whole. There we go. C clear as mud there. So another lesson in making sure you carefully read the lease, because uh, the, the formal wording in the lease, the formal uh, wording in the covenant, can drastically change what the tenant can and can't do. So after subletting, moving down our list of dispositions, we've got a covenant uh, parting with possession. Now that will preclude an assignment and a subletting, but it goes further and it catches other dispositions which do not amount to a full assignment. And then finally, sharing possession or sharing occupation, that goes even further and it prevents the shared occupation or the shared control of the premises. And we've got a sliding scale here. Uh, even under this uh, all-encompassing widest prohibition, because a mere license or a presence on the site may well be okay. But if the occupier has any real control over what happens on the premises, then that is a no. So, moving off alienation, let's look at the third of our commonly encountered uh, non-rent breaches, alterations. Here, perhaps more than in any other area, we need to consider whether the covenant is qualified or absolute. Again, because of section 19.2 of the 1927 Act. Uh, we touched on that earlier, but it raises its head frequently in alienation, uh, in alteration cases. Uh, so remember for qualified covenants, if a landlord unreasonably refuses consent, the landlord cannot forfeit. But again, always worth Bearing in mind, the tenant has got to always apply for consent before doing the works. Otherwise, the landlord can act as unreasonably as he or she likes and the tenant will still be in breach. What have I included here? Uh, what, what is an alteration? Yes, we often have knotty questions of what is an alteration. So I've touched on this here. Um, for, 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 for posterity's sake, uh, you'll get a copies of these notes uh, after, after the webinar. But uh, an alteration is often said to be a change that would affect the form or structure of the premises. Um, however, replacement of plant for like, uh, bigger pardon, replacement of like for like is generally speaking not seen as an alteration. Okay then, last of all in our list of common non-rent breaches, we have dilapidations, disrepair. Now this is common, insofar as landlords try to go down this route. But the reality is they're often dissuaded when they realize all of the hurdles they must overcome to forfeit for disrepair. First of all, I'm going to look at section 18.2 of our old friend, the 1927 Landlord and Tenant Act. Now, most landlords, to be frank, don't appreciate that this provision even exists. But what this section provides is that a landlord must prove the fact that a section 146 notice has been served on the tenant is known to either the tenant, the subtenant, or the person who last paid rent under the tenancy. So this is not simply proving that a section 146 notice has been served. You've got to prove the fact that it has been served on the tenant has been brought to the attention of one of these individuals. On top of that, you've got to allow a reasonably sufficient uh, time to have passed to allow the tenant to repair since service of the 146 notice came to the knowledge of such person. So again, a little puzzling here because we all know that you need to allow a reasonable period of time between service of the section 146 notice before you forfeit to allow the tenant to remedy the breach. But section 18.2 goes further. It says you must leave a reasonable period of time, not from service, but from when the notice came to the knowledge of the re relevant person. So this is an additional hurdle for disrepair that landlords frequently forget about. However, the one bit of good news is that 
The Act also provides that service by registered post or recorded delivery, as we now term it, raises a presumption that the person has knowledge of the notice. So again, another reason for a scattergun approach to the service of Section 146 notice, uh, notices. Um, the next restriction on disrepair is our old friend, the Section 1 of the Leasehold Property Repairs Act 1938. Now, this will be more familiar to all of you, I'm sure. It applies to all leases of seven years or more, uh, with three or more years remaining at the date of service. The Act provides that any Section 146 notice uh, must contain a statement informing the tenant that it may serve a counter notice, claiming the benefit of the Act. If the landlord's Section 146 notice does not do that, then the landlord cannot forfeit for disrepair. And then, of course, if the tenant serves a counter notice, well, the landlord is prohibited from taking forfeiture action without the leave of the court. Uh, given, given, given the limits on time we've got, I won't deal with uh, the question of leave of the court, but really, to obtain leave, the landlord needs to show that the works have to be done now. Um, because they risk, uh, or not doing the works, risks damage or loss to the freehold reversion, or perhaps damage to neighbouring property or the like. So as you can imagine, forfeiting for disrepair is not generally seen as a savoury prospect, uh, although it's frequently threatened by landlords. Okay, so we've covered our four non-rent breaches. So we all know the final step before you can forfeit is service of the Section 146 notice. But before then, we have something else, because leases sometimes require a further step for a landlord to take before he can forfeit. Um, frequently, for example, with rent, you've got to wait 21 days before you can forfeit. For non-rent breaches, I've come across cases where notice must first be served on the tenant, giving them the chance to remedy, or where notice has got to be served on a mortgagee. Uh, so the mortgagee has got to be notified prior to service of the Section 146 notice. And as was made clear in the Court of Appeal case of Toms and Rubery, that's a 2019 case, this is a contractual precondition and such contractual preconditions must be satisfied before the right to forfeit arises. And so no 1464 uh, notice can be served until that time. And then determination of breach. Well, this is a big one for residential properties. For all of these non-rent breaches, you can't just serve a 146 notice until you get a determination of breach or the breach has been admitted. There's a whole world of law on determinations in the tribunal, but it's easy to forget how long this can take. Uh, it's not a quick fix for the landlord. But the good news is, as far as the landlord is concerned, although a pitfall in that it will take time and money for a landlord to obtain a determination of breach, in most cases, the tenant will end up paying the costs of this exercise, assuming the FTT, the tribunal, finds that there has been a breach. Because in the vast majority of leases, the lease will include provision for costs to be paid, which will include the costs of going to the tribunal if this was in contemplation of or incidental to the service of a 146 notice. But be warned, not all clauses are treated the same. So again, there's been a series of cases recently which make the point that there's a distinction between the phrase in contemplation of proceedings and the narrower term incidental to preparation of a 146 notice. On top of that, if the landlord did not contemplate forfeiture, perhaps it couldn't because the right to forfeit had already been waived, then this cost entitlement doesn't arise. I suggest that anyone faced with these issues uh, considers and reads the latest Court of Appeal case, which is up on your screen, London Borough of Tower Hamlets and Khan, because it goes into this, uh, uh, these, these issues uh, 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 and distinctions um, in some detail. Uh, finally here then, what do, what do I mean by the determination must be clear as to the breach? Um, well, let's say there has been use as a brothel and you've applied for the, as the landlord for a determination of breach and you go down the immoral use or, uh, use route but you also go down the nuisance and annoyance route and the FTT faced with these two potential breaches of covenant says simply yes there has been a breach well that's not good enough and the upper tribunal has made that clear the determination must be clear as to what covenant has been breached the reason for that is that the tenant has got to know what is required of it to remedy the breach so in our example, 
Does it need to stop the prostitution entirely or does it just ask the punters to keep the noise down? Finally, then, we have the Section 146 notice itself. And we'll deal with that briefly. Um, you found your breach, you've got your determination, you've ticked all the boxes, only then can you serve the 146 notice. Uh, it's necessary for all rent breaches. It's not in a prescribed form, but it must uh, 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 tick all of the boxes that we've got up on screen. Uh, and last but not least, two brief points to be aware of. Section 196 of the Law of Property Act, uh, this is partly obligatory, any notice must be in writing, but otherwise it's a section which makes presumptions. Uh, you can serve the notice at the property address or the last known address of the tenant. You can serve by other means, of course, but you then don't benefit from, from the presumptions under that section. And last of all, service, who to serve? Think about that, a sign or, or a signee. In reality, a, uh, serve on both. Joint tenants, all of them must be served. In short, always serve on too many than too few. And the same with addresses. Serve at the property, serve at any other address you have for the tenant. Now, after having walked you through breaches and determinations and notices, we're all ready to forfeit. So I'm now going to hand you over to Peter, who's going to remind us that things aren't always as simple as they appear. Thank you, Jamal. Uh, um, uh, am I sharing my screen? You are indeed, Peter. Oh, excellent. Great. Right. So, um, Jamal, having led you this far, uh, I'm going to deal with waiver of the right to forfeiture, and I've subtitled uh, this element of the talk, Elephant Traps for Landlords. And I can assure you all that uh, no, no elephants were harmed in the making of these slides. Uh, this is what as Justice Sachs thought of the law of, forth of waiver. So let's, let's take you through that minefield. And uh, firstly, starting with the fundamentals of waiver. Um, waiver, first of all, is the waiver of the right to forfeit. It's not a waiver of the breach. So, for example, if the, failure is, if the breach is the failure to pay rent, just because you waive the right to forfeit doesn't mean you can't sue for the rent. Uh, and waiver comes under the law of election. So if you do waive uh, the right to forfeit, it's an irrevocable election to treat the lease as continuing, despite the fact that you could have elected to bring it to an end. Uh, and it's just the same as with in contract law, where there's been a repudiatory breach, uh, the innocent party must elect whether to carry on with the contract or treat it as an end. And that's, that's what waiver is in respect of leases. The key elements of waiver are threefold. Firstly, the landlord has to have knowledge of his right to waive. So he must know there has been a breach before he can waive it. Um, once he has that knowledge, he must unequivocally recognise the continuance of the lease. And thirdly, that recognition must be communicated to the tenants. So it's those three elements that uh, I'm going to concentrate on this morning. The first of all, knowledge. So it's the knowledge of the facts, the factual situation of the breach, which give rise to the right to forfeit, is not the knowledge of the legal ramifications of, of the breach. And the reasons for that are, I don't know, explained in the David Blackston case, that if a landlord could simply say, oh, well, I, I didn't realize the technicalities of the law of forfeiture, uh, then he could, uh, <laughs> um, tenants could get away with saying that uh, waiver had happened willy-nilly. And there are three types of knowledge. 
actual knowledge, constructive knowledge, and imputed knowledge. Uh, actual knowledge is fairly straightforward and presents little difficulty. Either the landlord knows there's been a breach or he doesn't. So the landlord knows the rent hasn't been paid or, 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 or he doesn't. Uh, more difficulty is pre presented by uh, constructive knowledge. So the photograph here on the left hand side, it really sums up. Uh, what constructive knowledge is all about. If the landlord has got a reasonable grounds for suspecting that there is a breach, but chooses not to investigate any, any further, um, he will be precluded from running a defense of ignorance to, to the waiver. Um, and in, in its essence, if a landlord chooses to bury his head in the sand, uh, despite knowing that, um, or, or what, um, a wall has been demolished when it shouldn't have been, or thinking that it might have been, uh, uh, I mean, told that it has, but investigates no further, then he can't set up that as a, an effective defence to a, a waiver. If, however, he approaches the tenant, let's say in a subletting case, uh, and the tenant um, obviously believes that the property has been sublet, the tenant assures that it hasn't, as long as the ten tenant's uh, explanation is reasonable and not fanciful, um, then the landlord's entitled to rely on that explanation. Uh, but it's a matter of fact and degree as to what will amount to constructive knowledge uh, and what invest investigations should have taken place. There are two cases, um, both rather entertaining, uh, which demonstrate the extremes of these. So the first is uh, Van Harlem and Kasner in 1992, and this was a judgment of, um, uh, uh, who was it now? Um, uh, Mr. Justice Harlan, whose judgments are notorious. But this involved um, a flat being used for illegal purposes, namely spying. And uh, for those of you who don't know, this year is the 60th anniversary of the first James Bond film, and that's one of the best James Bond spies there, uh, Rosa Klebb from, from Russia with Love. But um, anyway, in the, in the Van Harlan case, the uh, Car Mr. Karsner had um, as I say, been arrested for spying. He'd been charged with treason. He was going on trial for it. Uh, he denied the charges. Um, the landlord tried to forfeit, as I say, for illegal use of the, of the flat that he was living in. He had yet to be found guilty, um, but Mr Justice Harlan said that, well, actually the landlord could have, should have carried out his own investigations as to whether this man was actually guilty of spying or not. How was supposed to do that when no doubt the security services and uh, the police were still investigating it and proved, proved his guilt? I don't know. But that's an extreme case where the landlord was found to have constructive knowledge. At the other end of the spectrum, in the Roberts and uh, um, McIlwraith Christie case, uh, an elderly woman had been lived in the basement a flat of a Kensington, large Kensington house. The landlord and his family lived upstairs, and she'd been subletting one of the rooms against them. Uh, 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 the lease provisions for 18 years. Uh, bearing in mind the landlord lived upstairs, uh, the Court of Appeal found that um, there was no constructive knowledge because it might have been that she was just a lodger, which was not a breach of the lease. Uh, and, and another uh, unusual aspect of that case, you'll note the date. Judgment was handed down on the 1st of January. Right? Uh, how that came about, I don't know. So that's constructive knowledge. Basically, you can't bury your head in the sand. And um, <coughs> excuse me, if you're put on notice that there's something maybe afoot, then you need to investigate. Uh, moving on then to imputed knowledge. Imputed knowledge is where you don't have personal knowledge, uh, but somebody else's knowledge is imputed to you. Uh, so employees and agents are the most obvious candidates. 
And when one thinks about a corporate landlord, well, the corporate landlord is not a, a living entity. And so all knowledge must be imputed to, the, to a corporate landlord. And whether knowledge will be imputed uh, really depends on the knowledge holder's actual or ostensible author authority and what their, uh, their role is in either the organization or in um, as an employee or as, as an agent. So a good example of this is the Metropolitan Properties case, which is just on the previous slide. Um, there was a corporate landlord. Uh, they employed a management assistant, which who looked after a block of 120 flats. Um, and then they employed porters, whose duties included reporting to the management assistant um, any changes of personnel in, in the flats. So if they thought somebody had uh, assigned their lease, they were to uh, in, inform the management assistant. Um, the porters had a suspicion of assignment. That suspicion was imputed to the managing assistant, which was then, then imputed to the landlord. And it's a fine example of A, the distinction, and B, the interplay between constructive and imputed knowledge. And when we consider the facts of this case, the porter had constructive knowledge, didn't actually know that there'd been an assignment, which was imputed to the managing assistant, which was then, then imputed to the landlord upon the onus, upon whose onus it was to investigate or be fixed with constructive knowledge. So if you can pick the bones out of that, uh, well done. Um, the final element was communication. I'll, I'll deal with that now. We'll come back to the actual um, unequivocal recognition of the lease next. But dealing with communication first, it's got to be the landlord's decision has got to be communicated to the tenant. And the tenant uh, must be induced into thinking that despite his breach, the lease is going to continue. Now, communication will often be intrinsic in the landlord's recognition of the continuance of the lease. So if a landlord said, expressly says that he's accepting the rent, well, he's, he's communicating it there. Uh, or perhaps serving injunction proceedings to enforce, for enforce a uh, covenant of the lease. Uh, and an unusual example is the David Blackstone case. In this case, the landlord posted a rent demand, uh, for the moment assuming a demand for rent is a waiver of the right to forfeit. Um, after posting the demand, he learned of the tenant's breach, um, but before, the tenant received the demand. The tenant's counsel therefore argued that by the time the demand was received, um, having, having not been withdrawn anyway, uh, that was a waiver. Fortunately, the judge uh, lent some sense to the case and held that um, the landlord must have knowledge before posting the demand, but the election does not become effective until it's received. So moving now on to uh, the unequivocal recognition of the lease or affirmation um, of, the, of, of the lease, uh, which is the term used in um, um, contract law. So first of all, uh, the affirmation will not waive the right to forfeit in respect of breaches which the landlord has no knowledge, forfeit in respect of future breaches, or as I said earlier, other contractual remedies such as debt claims, damages, injunctions, etc. So affirmation may be uh, expressed, 
with that. there's no difficulty with that. The landlord just says, well, you haven't paid your rent, but we're going to carry on with the lease in any event, and uh, I'll just sue you for the rent. And of course, that's been very popular over the past two, two or three years, um, because landlords don't want to lose tenants, they want to hold them to their lease. What is more difficult is implied affirmation by the landlord's conduct. And uh, the leading case on this is Expert Clothing Service, uh, Services Sales Limited. And it's important to note uh, the high hurdle that a tenant has to overcome to rely on the defensive waiver. And the landlord's conduct has to be so unequivocal that when considered objectively, it could only be regarded as having been done consistently with the continued existence of the tenancy. So the points to take away from that are, it can only be regarded and must be so unequivocal. Um, so if there are two explanations for the landlord conduct, uh, that's not a waiver. It doesn't matter if one explanation is better than another, it's just going to be so unequivocal and can only be regarded as consistent with uh, continued uh, existence of the lease. The most renowned <coughs> uh, implied affirmation of a lease is acceptance of rent. And uh, this uh, lives in a category of its own. And It's the first of all, it's the acceptance of rent uh, that results in a waiver, not the payment of rent. And those are two very different things. The accept so money might be transferred uh, automatically to the landlord's bank account, but we may not even know it's there. But it's been paid, but it's not accepted until the landlord has knowledge of it and um, and says and doesn't return it, uh, impliedly accepting it or just simply accept it as a payment. Uh, and it's not any rent um, that results in the waiver of the rights forfeit. Again, it's rent that's accepted, which goes to evidence the continuance of the lease. And it also must have fought more full due after the right to forfeit has arisen. So if you're demanding arrears of rent, which uh, accrued before the, before the right to forfeit arose, before the breach, that can't be a waiver. Uh, and looking at an example, uh, if rent is paid monthly on the first, of, or falls due monthly on the first of the month, and the tenant fails to pay the first of April's rent, on the 1st of May, the landlord accepts the rent due. He waives for May, he waives the right to forfeit in, rela in relation to April's rent. Because by accepting the rent in May, he's saying the lease then must be still be in continuance in May after the 1st of April rent is fallen due. However, if one considers a situation where the right to forfeit doesn't arise, say, until 40 days has elapsed after a breach or failure to pay rent, uh, and the landlord accepts the May rent then, there's no way of the right to forfeit because his right to forfeit doesn't arise until the 11th of May, 40 days after the 1st of April. And so he can't waive until the right has arisen. Um, and the same, <clears throat> rent falls into its own special category. And once it is accepted after the breach has occurred, um, and um, it, it automatically weighs. Uh, other conduct, though, uh, there are no set rules, apart from the first one I'm going to mention. It all goes to looking at the totality of the landlord's conduct 
and, and establishing whether objectively that amounts to uh, a recognition of continuance of the lease. Uh, so the first one is a slight acceptance, and that's uh, using the commercial rent arrears recovery procedure, formerly known as distress. Uh, in both cases, uh, distress and the trial procedure, the lease must be afoot. So you can only use you can only use the former distress or cron as it is now, if there is a lease in existence. The one exception is that um, that it can be used once a lease has come to an end, but not if the lease is brought to an end by forfeiture. So in the case of Bra, there they said that uh, that would that wouldn't save the landlord uh, who had attempted uh, to use Bra. Uh, in fact, before I do move on from that, I just had an interesting case where the landlord did not attempt to exercise the commercial rent arrears recovery, but he had served a notice. So in Bra, they actually actually exercised the Bra, Bra procedure. So that but what is not decided is whether a notice is sufficient, which is required under the Act. Uh, to waive the right to forfeit. Um, so other conduct, uh, serving, serving arrear uh, proceedings, I say serving rather than issuing because it's got to be communicated, uh, for arrears of rent that have accrued after the right to forfeit has arisen without seeking possession. If you're going to issue for proceedings with a claim for arrears of rent, that's fine. Uh, serving injunction proceedings to enforce the terms of the lease. Um, if, you, if you're serving injunction proceedings after the right to forfeit has arisen, then, well, you must be relying on the terms of the lease uh, and treating it as continuing. Uh, relying on the terms of the lease generally, I would suggest that the, the more intrusive or demanding the landlord's actions are, which he seeks to justify by the terms of the lease, the more likely it is to be a waiver. So if he's demanding access and thus uh, interfering with the terms of quiet enjoyment uh, on the basis of the lease provisions, uh, that's very likely to be held uh, as a waiver of the right to forfeit. So conduct that has been held not to waive the right to forfeit. Firstly, without prejudice negotiations, as they're not admissible in evidence, uh, they can't be relied on as a waiver of the right to forfeit. Open negotiations, although they might be admissible, unless the landlord's conduct is uh, only referable uh, to the subsistence of the lease, um, then it won't be a, a waiver of the right to forfeit. And that goes back to the expert closing case. Uh, a very useful one that's not a waiver is the acceptance of money from a guarantor, even rent. Whereas a current guarantee is a standalone contractual obligation. It's nothing to, well, it may be included in the lease. The obligation is, is nothing to do with the lease, it's standalone. Um, and uh, as such, um, it doesn't amount, it doesn't amount to waiver. Uh, fulfilling pre-existing pre contractual obligations. So for example, maybe a Tomlin order has been entered into, which requires the landlord to do something, a Tomlin order between the landlord and tenant from previous proceedings. If the landlord is obliged to do it under the Tomlin order, uh, then that won't be a waiver because he's he contractually bound to do it. Uh, <clears throat> and similarly, um, complying with statutory requirements, uh, most notably the um, uh, service charge consultation procedures. Again, that's been held uh, very recently in STEMP, uh, that that doesn't amount to a waiver of the right to forfeiture because it's a statutory obligation on the landlord. Whatever happens, the tenant 
remains a tenant uh, and if the landlord was uh, that was to be treated as a waiver and the landlord wouldn't be able to undertake it uh, and would be restricted to only recovering the 250 pounds from the errant tenant and some may think that well obviously service of 146 notice is not a waiver of the right to forfeit uh, because actually uh, that would be nonsensical because a 146 notice is a precursor to forfeiting but um, one of our brethren council tried to argue it <laughs> even, though, even despite the nonsensical nature of it uh, unfortunately failed uh, and then uh, finally uh, implied affirmation what about apportionments of money paid I'm sorry not apportion, appropriation of money paid um, to what debts and the demanding of rent and service charge rather than acceptance do they make them do they amount to the waiver of the right to forfeit well they take up vast amounts of space in this splendid book and rather than waste another half an hour of your time may I suggest reading the relevant uh, chapters in that so thank you very much and um, if there are any questions I believe um, Ed is going to deal with them thanks very much Peter um, I just just wanted to say because I know James, um, one of our um, attendees, has um, also applauded you for your fantastic clip art. So I, I'd, I'd like to <laughs> heartily endorse that as well. Um, there were a couple of questions, um, Peter, to you um, in the first instance. Um, you you talked in your slides and I didn't um, scribble down in time the case name, but you talked about um, receipt of a rent demand, um, which was sent out before the landlord having knowledge of a breach um, and then received after. Yes. You, I mean, it, it, it's it sounded like it was a one of those that you just think this is highly unlikely to ever happen but is it in if that does arise is it a sim is it as simple as writing to the tenant saying that rent demand is withdrawn but logically thinking and practically thinking about it it's not like anybody can go and pinch the envelope off the postman and say don't deliver that so yeah. how 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 it, is it right that you you simply have to say that rent demand was withdrawn well, in, in that in that case, the, the judges took a rather sensible approach and said, "Look, um, and <clears throat> to, to be uh, amount to a waiver, the landlord had to have had knowledge of the breach before the rent demand was put in the post." Um, but the completion of the the process was when it was received. So the landlord didn't have, actually have to do anything about it um, because he didn't have knowledge until it was on, until after it was put in the post. Um, I suppose now, nowadays um, most rent demands are electronic, aren't they? So they're sort of instantaneous. Yeah. Um, um, there's less likely the situation is going to arise. But um, let's say, the, the, the in relation to the last question I posed, the perceived wisdom, although there's only first instance authority, is that a demand for rent does amount to it, uh, um, a waiver of the right to forfeit. However, um, we disagree with that, and actually. Um, when you get any said about writing a book and you research these things properly, it all hangs on a, um, a 19th century case, which doesn't actually say that. 
and has just been repeated in various various uh, judgments and um, uh, and academic books um, on the subject. Uh, and as I say, the nobody has ever decided it beyond the first instance. And um, in fact, um, one seminar in relation to when it's in the book, um, Lord Newberger, as he now is, addressed the issue at, at first instance in the, and in the Court of Appeal and, and in, in the Supreme Court um, without reaching a decision on it. Fair enough. Um, Jamal, you, um, you touched on um, illegal purposes clauses um with um briefly because I, it is a very rare as you say rare occasion that it come, crops up just out of interest um what at, at what point does it become illegal is it and uh, peter touched on this with um with the spy case as well is it that you have to have a conviction before it becomes illegal or is it that the landlord objectively says what you're doing is illegal and I'm happy that it is and you will be convicted of it. Is is there that interlink between criminal law or is it as simple as saying no I think it is and you're gone? It, it is an excellent question actually. Um, I think really the, the issue there is um, evidential proof. The, the reality is you don't need to have a conviction for something to be illegal but the judge uh, in the civil judge deciding the case, if the forfeiture is uh, opposed or the entitlement to forfeiture is opposed, would have to be satisfied that what the tenant did was actually illegal. Um, query uh, whether that has to be a, a finding on the criminal standard. I would suggest it would have to be. So, you know, beyond reasonable doubt, as it were, as opposed to balance of probabilities. But there wouldn't need to be a criminal conviction. Of course, the reality is without a criminal conviction, it's going to be pretty hard to convince a judge that this activity was illegal, like, save for the, the clearest of cases. Um, so in those situations, uh, the, the very few I've come across, it's often on the back of a conviction. And then the landlord can simply wave that in front of the civil judge and say, you don't need to worry, worry your pretty little head about this. It's definitely illegal because your, your, your colleague in the Crown Court has said so. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it's a good point. But I suspect in reality, that's more an evidential issue as opposed to um, a legal issue. And that, um, that not necessarily the illegal purpose, but non, non rent breaches generally, is there a tactically, is there a benefit in including non rent and rent breaches in, in seeking forfeiture on, on the basis that some of those, not yep. all of, not all non-rent breaches, but some non-rent breaches will be irremediable. Yes, like that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that horrendous word that I would say. Uh, yes. So, so what again? What I'd always suggest is, you know, frankly, in for a penny, in for a pound. If there's going to be several breaches, just do the whole lot. However, uh, normally, if you're going down the rent route. That's nice and easy. It's very simple. You don't even need a 146 notice and it's a lot quicker. But the reality is, if you're going to try and forfeit for a very small amount of money that, yeah, the te tenant, tenant was technically in breach, but they're going to be able to pay that £10 tomorrow, um, forfeiture may well be valid. Um, you may well also want to forfeit for other breaches because then you can, it's going to be a lot harder for the judge, uh, for, beg your pardon, for the tenant to obtain relief unless they remedy all of those other breaches other than just paying the £10. But, but Ed, you've trespassed onto relief from forfeiture, which is a topic for a webinar and, and a book, in fact, of, of its own. So uh, at least several chapters in our book. So, yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, and I don't think... Oh, the, the only other one that... Um, again, and this is moving into the to relief slightly, um, so my apologies you talked before about qualified covenants with little knowledge of that side of of the, the relief aspect of it is it as simple as if say for example it is an assignment and consent is required is it is relief as going to be granted simply by saying please can i have permission and 
you can't unreasonably withhold it. Is it as simple as that's your remedy or that that's the remedy that's required for it for the breach to then cease? Yes. So the the reality is, if it was a technical breach in the sense that no reasonable landlord could have reasonably refused if the tenant had actually formally asked for consent then yeah i'd suggest that in reality the relief will be unconditional or perhaps conditional only on paying um, um uh, a relevant fee or paying costs um, however if the assignment was unreasonable and it's one that the uh, judge finds the landlord could have reasonably refused uh, even then it's not the be all and end all for an application for relief generally speaking courts are pretty flexible about granting tenants relief and there's been a, a series of court of appeal cases on that um, generally speaking the tenant will be allowed a chance to try and find a better tenant a better a better, a, a better assignee or, or to sublet or to do something to salvage their interest their valuable uh, asset uh, uh, in, in the lease um, but but uh, yes hopefully that answers that super um, well I don't have any more and I can't see any others that have cropped up so I will um, thank you both Jamal and Peter for your time and expertise